an earth keeper heartfelt round of applause for the amazing author and teacher John Van Aken. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I don't know if you know it or not, but he has designed the vibrational coordination in our meditation room at headquarters with three magnificent stones that he's worked out the vibes. And now we get constant feedback from people. What did you do in that room? You know, I almost left my body. <laughs> And that's uh, Tibbs' great insight from that massive Atlantean incarnation with the crystals and all. So he's done a lot for ARE and Edgar Casey. Well, I have been asked to touch on the wild and wonderful story of aliens, unidentified flying objects, and uh, beings from other worlds. You might not be aware, but... Edgar Casey talked about this. He actually said, uh, in the coming age that we're moving into, the people of the earth are going to meet the people of the universe. <laughs> you know how he gave a lot of past life readings. That was one of his main things. Well, to one young woman, he was going through her past lives. You know, he would get in trance. So he would do this, he would, put his, he would lie down, put his hands over his forehead until he saw a white light. Once he saw it, he would move his hands over his solar plexus and he would slip into deep breathing and REM, rapid eye movement. And if you didn't give him the suggestion, he would fall asleep on you and have a dream, no reading. <laughs> but if you caught him, as his breathing got deep and his eyes started to go into REM, and you said, you will have before you the inquiring mind of Mary Smith, the white light would move, and he would move with it. And that's how he got his readings. In the course of those readings, mostly past life readings, because people came to him for health readings for about 20 years, and then one time, uh, one of the guys who got a health reading was all upset about his illness and said, well, why do I have this illness? And just as calm as a physical reading, Edgar said, because in a previous life, as a monk in France, you abused the body, and this is the karma of that situation, and everybody was stunned. Past lives, karma, reincarnation... So the next week, the whole family got their past life readings. <laughs> well, this young lady came to get a life reading. And in the course of saying her past life in France, and then she was in the Roman times, then she was in ancient Egypt, he casually says, and she was the princess of the Maya when this planet was being visited from other planets, other worlds. And everybody went, whoa, aliens, UFOs, how far out. So we do have support in the Edgar Casey reading for this concept. So let's get going through the material, and I'll guide you through it as we go. I was good friends with Zachariah Sitchin, who really brought alien knowledge to North America, at least, if not the world. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Sitchin? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to the choir. <laughs> well, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, he was a Russian Jew who migrated to Israel and became a journalist. But while he was in the Middle East, he started doing independent research on ancient Sumerian text. And then he uh, left Israel and uh, made his home with his wife in New York City, and that's where I met him. Uh, he's published many books, you see them here, um, and he's holding one of the ancient Sumerian artworks, uh, a replica of one of them, in which a lot of his uh, initial understanding uh, came to him, and someone gave him that as a 
as a gift. When I uh, got with uh, Zachariah, uh, we just hit it off right away. And he said to me, of all the material I studied, no one on the planet Earth had the same dates that I was finding except Edgar Casey." And he said, right then I knew this guy had to have something going for him. And I was, uh, at the time, I am director of the Edgar Casey Foundation. And at the time, I was in charge of all archaeological research. I still am, uh, but it shifted a little bit. I have subordinates now. Isn't that wonderful? Um, so uh, he and I got into this big discussion about the dates. And now I'm going to show you the date slide, but don't freak out. I will take you through it. It's a little uh, awesome, but Edgar Casey, believe it or not, gave a serious dating for uh, all of this. So as you can see, Edgar Casey has the beginning of creation about a half a billion years before the Earth really solidified into a planet, which our scientists date about 4.5 billion years ago. But Edgar says, the celestial beings that we are, the spirits that we are, our minds and uh, life force were swooping around this area because we foresaw what was coming. And so really, it, the beginning of the earth experience is prior to the earth being ready for us because we were connected to the infinite collective consciousness, we knew the, and could feel the flow of life and knew it was coming. So 4.6 billion years ago. Then a portion of these uh, celestial entities that we once were, about 12 million years ago, moved into the dimension we call Earth today. And Edgar Casey said that was the first root race. Now, when he says root race, he means uh, human race. It has nothing to do with the races yet. That doesn't happen for a while. Even the Maya have the same story. So the first expression of what you and I would call a soul attempting to look human-esque or come into this world in some form was in ancient Lemuria or Mu. Um, Edgar explained Mu is actually the greater name of the whole area, and Lemuria is the major center of that area. I'll explain the ghost part in a minute, but you were not physical at all. You were a mind and a spirit looking at the dimension, and you could see the vibrations of the low levels of this world as well as the three-dimensional levels, but you were still very much attuned to the celestial world. So you would appear ghostly. You're not in a body. About 10 million years ago, a second influx, and these were more like thought forms. And Edgar explains that what was happening was we were starting to shape in our minds how we might express ourselves in an individual appearance because we were actually one. We were like a school of fish or a flock of birds. We were intimately one. We turned together, we moved together, and he says the book of Job called us the morning stars sang together at the coming of humanity. And I'll show you that quote out of Job in a minute. So we were actually one. We were not differentiated. Now, if you study ancient Egyptian lore, uh, you will actually see them talking about the daughters of Isis, the sons of Ra, as a collective harmony of minds that were in oneness. There was no individual. Now, as you started to individuate, started to project yourself using your free will, in Egypt, they would say, um, Alice Isis, Mary Isis, Betty Isis, John Ra, Bob Ra. Do you see what's happening? They're, they're coming out of total union and harmony and starting to appear individualized so they get individual names. They are still nowhere near physical. Edgar said if you could imagine them as thought forms, you would actually see sort of the mind of Betty, the mind of John, 
you get the feel. Uh, but it was not contained. It, it could feel everything. It could move all around. Then comes, now that's still Lemuria. Uh, then comes Atlantis, and notice the age difference. Lemuria goes on for millions of years, uh, and it was non-physical. Then Atlantis comes because now we're really going to try to incarnate, which literally means come into matter and, and manifest ourselves in a physical body. 210,000 BC, the Atlantean civilization, the first truly physical. The Maya call that group the Blue Maze people. And they tell a wonderful little story. The children of God come before Mother God and they say, Mom, we've gone into a world that seems to attract us and also possess us, capture us. And she says, okay, bring me the heavenly water from the godly spirit of you, and I will make you a physical body that will be ideal for you manifesting in three dimensions. Now you're infinite, and now you're going to become finite. And she makes what the Maya call the blue maze people. And the blue maze people are perfect in every way. Now we start really the creation of matter, and that's the first creation. And in 106,000 BC, a body is created. And if you read Genesis carefully, you will see that in chapter 1, Elohim makes us in its image. Now that is celestial spiritual. Then in chapter 2, the author changes the name of God and says, Yahweh Elohim. Now, an English Bible will translate that Lord God. So God creates you in chapter 1, Lord God in chapter 2. And the way Yahweh Elohim does it is he takes the dust of the earth, shapes it, and breathes the breath of life, and you become incarnate in chapter 2. However, if you read it carefully, the Lord is walking with us in our new incarnate bodies, in this world of duality and separation. And the Lord says, this is not working. They are lonely here. They have lost touch with the oneness and they feel alone. So in chapter 2, around verse 20, um, Yahweh cast a deep sleep over the androgynous body that we call Adam. <clears throat> but it does not have a, cop a capital A. It's a lowercase a. In Hebrew, when the word is lowercase, it means a being, a person. And it has the connotation of a person with blood. It means a reddish person. In other words, blood in the body. Do you see? When you capitalize it, it becomes a name of a person. Do you see? So the androgynous being, and believe it or not, in Genesis, all the translators translate little a Adam as man, which really messes up the interpretation. But in the book of Numbers, they translate it person. I wish they had done that in Genesis. And then um, when God casts a deep sleep over us in the androgyny, he separates us out into yin and yang. And the first pulled out is the deeper yin, which is, um, in Hebrew, it's called Kava, the life giver, and eventually the name Eve. Now, if we had only named the other part that was remaining Bob, we would understand this a lot better. But, of course, they were male translators, <laughs> and they just capitalized the A, also, I'll tell you another terrible part of the translation. They use the word rib. Um, Sela in Hebrew actually means side. And do you know the almighty God in heaven uses that same word to tell Moses how to build the sides of the Ark of the Covenant? Side. But those buggers in Genesis went and translated it rib. And that put a diminished effect on yin, which should never have happened. And, but now more and more people are becoming aware of this. So yin and yang are now separate in two different bodies. And their first names were Lilith and, according to Casey, Amelius. 
Lilith was the first expression of femininity in an isolated feminine being form, and Amelius the masculine. Now here again, Edgar warns us, don't think they're as in body like you are in and like I'm in. It was nowhere near this dense. Nowhere near this dense. Very subtle. The Hopi tell us, so subtle that you could come and go. You could actually absorb your physical expression back into yourself and disappear. They say the door to heaven was left open in those days and you could come and go. You weren't being born through a womb yet. Do you understand? You hadn't gotten that physical. Do you understand? Okay, cool. So then in uh, 50,700 BC, um, we start to slip into selfishness and negativity, um, criticizing one another, starting to identify ourselves with a separate group from the others, and oneness falls apart. Also, a terrible thing occurs called hierarchies. The children of God were in one harmony, totally one, all of them. But this group, this fringe group, started to develop the idea that I'm actually prettier than you. And therefore, you're subordinate to me. I'm actually stronger than you. And hierarchy started to develop, which was not the way in the heavens, in the celestial world. So things really got tricky and messy. And the first breakup in Atlantis occurs there. And that's where the misattunement of the crystals started. I'll tell you more about the crystals as we go through. Uh, in 28,000 BC comes the second breakup of Atlantis because oh, unbelievably, we take the life-giving crystal and turn it into the death ray. And we start killing animals. Now, the Hopi say the animal kingdom and the human kingdom were side by side, never ate one another, never hurt one another, until suddenly there was a shift in our side by a faction, not all of you, and I'm sure most of you here were not a part of this, and they started to kill animals and attack them. And that really broke things up worse. And then 22,800 BC, Edgar says, is the legendary great flood that you will find legends of all around the planet. And that correlates to Genesis chapter 6, when God regrets the creation and is going to start over. And it cleanses the earth by water. And so in Genesis, God cleansed and the first creation ends. And Edgar says the second creation begins 12,000 B.C. The logos of God, the essence of God comes into the earth with us and decides to participate with us. And we have a recreation of Adam and Eve. Now, Casey says, so he was asked, well, where were Lilith and Amelis? And he said they were in the first garden of Eden in Poseidia Atlantis. Adam and Eve were the physical second uh, creation in Tigris and Euphrates River and what today we call Iraq. And that was the Garden of Eden that we're familiar with. But he says the first Eden was Eden in Poseidia Atlantis. And that starts the Adamic body. It's like our body, but still quite different. And then in 10,500 BC, uh, there is a full movement out of the heavens to build light centers, training centers, initiation centers all around the planet. And they build pyramids all around the planet because of pyramid energy. The largest pyramid on the planet is in Xi'an, China. It's twice the size of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Uh, but there are pyramids everywhere, and I've written uh, several articles and shown a lot of them. And a lot of people have written articles on this. Atl uh, Lemuria has sunk, and uh, migrations of all the Lemurians has occurred. They have all headed to new territories and built new temples. Now Atlantis sinks, final destruction of Atlantis. It, it, it sank in several stages. Is 10,014 B.C., and the second creation begins because there's nothing left of the first creation. And now you only have the human forms here um, in physical dimension. This doesn't mean the fairies, elves, angels were not here. 
But Edgar said they maintained their presence on the other side of the veil. They can come through the veil, but they maintain their presence. So on this side of the veil is the animal kingdom, the mineral kingdom, and us. And this is, so notice uh, the big arrow. It's showing that this is a descent out of the heavens into matter. And Edgar points out this only occurred to a, sm a, a relatively small portion of all the beings God conceived. Or think of God as the creative force or the collective mind. Edgar say, says the collective mind is one infinite universal consciousness and suddenly within itself it conceived points of consciousness. Countless points of consciousness gave them all free will. And some of them you and me, entered this dimension. But many have not. They're in other dimensions. And he talks about all of that and where they are and all. So you and I descended out of the celestial spirit mind realm into matter gradually over a period of time until we're in these things we're sitting in here and I'm standing in. Hard to feel spiritual. Also, uh, Zachariah would, and I would get into wonderful discussions because the difference between his view of the Anunnaki being an advanced race from somewhere else coming in and affecting the human race, um, uh, Casey actually says, we were them. Now, there were lower uh, souls who had really lost their way and were trapped in matter like caveman and ape man and those stages. So in some ways, you and I were super powerful to them. In fact, you could think of us as gods uh, if we were overseeing some of those severely trapped in matter with no consciousness of who they really were. Here are the stages, the three waves that Casey puts in. First, there was a push their way into matter willfully, and they became trapped in matter, deep matter. Now, you and I could be here, but we weren't trapped. Like the Hopi teach, we could come and go. But some pushed themselves so deeply in matter, and matter was not prepared for them. So that's where the mythology of half horse, half man, half female, half fish, you see, that's where all those legends, they were pushing themselves into matter, and there was no human form for them. And they really got lost. And they also got trapped in the evolution of matter. So this group, the first uh, spirit being groups, willfully pushed their way in and got all messed up. A heartfelt group decided to go in to help them. And they got trapped too. It was very confusing. In fact, the Maya tell the story where the children of God came before Mother God and said, Mom, this is tricky. We got in here, and somehow it got a hold of us, and we're possessed. Uh, so the wonderful stories of how even the idealistic second group got trapped trying to help the first group. So then there was a meeting in heaven in which they said, no one's going in here without a plan of how to get out. And that group Jesus called the elect. They elected to come in with a plan. Now, Zachariah and I would think in our discussions, could this have been what he was seeing? So the legends, he and I started to see how this idea of the elect could be his Anunnaki coming in to uh, manage human genetic reproduction. In fact, Edgar does say, we advance the race as you would breed animals. Um, here's Casey's reading. Spirit is God's presence. Spirit. The spirit of God moved and matter came into being. For the opportunities of his associates, his companions, his sons, his daughters, these are ever spoken of as one. Do you ever think of yourself as his associate, his companion? When Edgar Casey gave you a reading, any of us a reading, he always mentioned that you have lost awareness of this.
but you are actually a companion of the creator of the entire universe. And at some point, you're going to become aware of that. Um, and that's going to uh, cast you far above where you are now in your vision, your understanding. Okay, then there came self-indulgence, self-glorification. And there was the beginning of warring among themselves for activity. He said that they really split into two groups, and he called the one group the children of the law of one, that everyone is equal. Every, there is a oneness underlying all life, even though in this dimension it all looks separate, there is a oneness. The other group were called the sons of Belial, and we really didn't know that term until we found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And in there it said, Belial was the leader of the dark angels. Whoa! So, I mean, here now we're starting to, if, if this sort of stuff would fire up Zachariah so much, he would get charged up. And uh, we would record him lecturing. We still have the recording. And he came down and lectured at our Ancient Mysteries conferences uh, twice. Uh, but, Edgar says, this was still in spirit. So he, he wants to point out to you that the real battle between the children of light and the children of darkness occurred in the spirit. And the key to the, sh the shift was self-indulgence, self-focus, self-gratification, self-glorification. As soon as you started to do that, you pulled out of oneness, and that caused a lot of trouble. Then those that became selfish were moved by the spirit of rebellion and they pushed into matter, became what we see in our three-dimensional world today. Now here are the stages. Um, spirits come visiting Lemuria and Mu. Then uh, the spirits impress themselves and become material beings, matter beings, physical beings only with semi-consciousness of their spiritual nature. And Edgar points out, this is Noah and the intuitive awareness. And he points out that Noah is occurring all around the planet. It's not just one man. But enlightened beings at different places in the planet are aware we need a cleansing, and they prepare for it. And then finally, we're back to spirits that are visiting matter. Um, even though we will have a full illumination and the glorious age will come, uh, Edgar quotes, there'll be no evil on the earth. There will be love, harmony, enlightenment, and growth and purification of matter. So matter is more accommodating to spirit and mind. He says we'll have 12 chakras. And some guy asked him to name the other above the seven chakras. And, he, and calmly from trance, he said, why? You're not using the seven. Why do you need to know the 12? <laughs> so keep that in mind when you maybe you ought to fire up the seven for a while and then ask the big question. All right, we're somewhere between that. So here's Anunnaki symbolism, statuesque uh, attempts. Uh, could they have been the Nephilim in, in Genesis 6? Because Genesis 6 says there were all kinds of creatures on the earth before the flood and the cleansing. And um, it is possible because uh, Zachariah said the Anunnaki were not purely idealistic. Some among them were selfish and self-seeking what they wanted. And they used humans in that way. But some actually were um, empathetic to humanity and wanted to help. If you've read your books, you know all of this from him. Uh, the sixth chapter of Genesis opens with the Lord surveying the earth and finding that it has all become evil and corrupt. Keep in mind that there are dimensions to the earth realms, and the scriptures say that the Lord's focus in this passage is only on, quote, the surface of the ground. So in other words, you got to watch that chapter in Genesis because God's only talking about the real physical bodied people on the earth's surface. Um, uh, here's the message. It happened when men began to multiply on the surface of the ground and daughters were born to them. Now these are like the uh, physical earth beings, uh, 
an advancement of ape man, cave man, a stage going along, but very physical. That God's sons, and I'll explain those sons are also male and female, uh, because Casey gave readings for women in which she said, oh, here's a son of God. And, you know, she was a woman. So the sons of God are both. I'll show you that in a minute. Saw that men's daughters were beautiful. And let me explain that. When you express the yin or the kava, Hebrew helps you with this. It is your deeper, beautiful, intuitive self. The yin is the inner, the hidden and it is the intuitive. It is the life giver, the conceiver. When it's expressed physically, it is absolutely attractive to every human being. It is seen as the fairer sex. But it's seen that way because it is the yin. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's not so much lust and sexuality as totally captivated by the manifestation in form of the hidden, the unseen, the inner. And if you think about a woman's body, everything occurs within her. She's in the pattern of the cycle of the moon. She conceives within her. She gestates life. You don't see anything but a big belly, but in there is life growing. When she delivers the life from within her, she brings nourishment, nourishment from within her in the form of the mammary gland uh, milk and nourishes the child from within. Now, guys, you and I are, are the same way. We have the yin with us. So don't feel left out. Remember, over the past 50 years, Carl Jung and the psychologists have been wanting us to get in touch with our feminine and spin hell. And our wives have been pushing us. But we have grown a lot. We are in touch with our feminine, thank God. And Jung explained to us, Jung said, if you're manifesting femininity, woman, you're not whole yet because the wholeness of your consciousness includes yang, masculine. Men, if you're expressing the masculine, you're not whole in consciousness because the whole consciousness includes the yin. Therefore, for me, a male, the feminine is in my subconscious. And remember how Jung used to talk about a, a woman in my dreams is probably that portion of my inner self in interaction with my outer self. And women, a, a potent or uh, captivating male in your dreams, he would say, is your animus trying to communicate with you, the anima. Do you see how he worked it? Because the whole consciousness has both yin and yang in it. We'll see more of this. And Oh, here it is right here. I, I already got a good slide. This is the sculpture of the sons of daughters take the daughters of men. But I, I need to explain to you, like this uh, Hindu chart on the, road, uh, on the right, uh, Shiva and Shakti are of one being, yin and yang. And Genesis 2, uh, verses 18 to 25 is where the division occurred. Prior to verse 18 of chapter 22... We were androgynous. And Edgar said Atlanteans and Lemurians had both. And if one of their soul group wanted to incarnate, they would conceive within their own being a form for them to use. You see? But once they were separated, then you had to bond. But see, the Lord wanted that to happen because they were lonely and this would be companionship. Do you see? That's the way the story is told. And this lovely sculpture I just enjoyed here, but I just want to point out, ladies, the angelic male there uh, would ideally be both male and female. Uh, and Edgar talks about that a lot, that, uh, that they were both for a long period of time, and then when it was separated. So he says, if you, just like Jung, if you really want to get fully illuminated... You have to get in touch with the opposite energy of your expressed gender and your mind thought. As you ladies know, us men are just not males. We're mind thoughts of males. And you've been around that long enough, you know. <clears throat> and we men are still trying to figure you out. 
That's what, that, that great book, Women Are From Venus and Men Are From Mars, or the NFL, one or the other. <laughs> um, we're the Anunnaki and the humans in any way interconnected, and, and you know Sitchin says they started to get involved. At first, they just did um, husbandry breeding uh, and tried to build their slave uh, communities to do the work they needed and all. But eventually some of them got involved, and here's where Edgar said, yes, there, there was celestial touching of material beings, and they would uh, conceive. And he explained that the Nephilim were the children of those conceptions uh, and other creatures that are in legend and, and lore. Um, ancient Egyptians also knew this. They actually called us star beings, and they said that we would regain our star body, which Aku or Ak, Aku or Ak, when our soul blended again with our spirit. Do you see how they're showing again the gender split, soul and spirit? And when they when those two unite, you have the Aku, the star being. So they also knew we were uh, descendants of the stars, uh, children of Ra. Uh, in giving a past life reading for, this is that priestess I told you about, the Mayan priestess from other worlds, other planets. And then you go down a little further and he talks about Job 38, the morning stars. And then he talks about the people of the universe and how we will meet them and we will start to have a full consciousness of the celestial world. An entity passes uh, from this world into the spirit world. And uh, this is a lovely reading, so I'm going to read the whole thing to you as we go here. You can read it on the screen. As an entity passes from this present time or this solar system, this sun, these forces, it passes through various spheres on and on through the eons of time and space leading first into that central force known as Arcturus. Arcturus, according to Edgar Cayce, is the stargate in and out of here. He was talking stargates in the 20s and 30s before we had the movie and the TV series. And the stargate is the star Arcturus. Um, Nearer the Pleiades, eventually an entity passes into the inner forces, inner sense, then they may again, after a period of nearly 10,000 years, enter into the earth to make manifest or to make real those forces gained in its passage. As the soul gains things, it wants to practice them and make them fully a part of itself. In entering, the entity takes on those forms that may be known in the dimensions of that plane which it occupies. There being not only three dimensions as of the earth, but there may be seven as in Mercury. Now let me stop there and tell you, he's not talking about you landing on the surface of Mercury. He is saying that the three-dimensional planet we see is a three-dimensional representation of a higher dimension of fifth and seventh dimensional order. And it relates, just like astrology says, to the mind and mental dimension. When he looks at Venus, he says that is a planet in the third dimension, but it is also the higher realms of love, art, music, all the creativity materials, he said. And he actually would start a reading by saying, oh, here's a soul who came from Venus. And of course, the lady would say, no, uh, no I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, yes, your body was. Okay, um, in Mercury, or four in Venus, or five in Jupiter. There may be only one, as in Mars. Remember... Uh, George Patton thought he uh, incarnated to be a warrior for the World War II from Mars, and he believed in uh, reincarnation, and he knew his past lives. There may be many more, as in those of Neptune, and they may become even nil until purified in Saturn's fires. General Motors would not have named that car if they had known this information. Edgar said, Saturn is where all inadequate flesh goes to be redone. 
And one of my favorite readings, because I knew this lady personally, was he said to this lady, oh, here's a soul who's gone to Saturn often, and God loves one who's willing to start over. <laughs> uh, not a vacation spot. So Edgar does see a magnificent celestial thing. Uh, we are currently doing this uh, between physical incarnations. When you die, your soul just doesn't rest in peace. It's very busy. There is a transition period. So your loved one, when they passed on, they went through a transition period. But eventually that soul is attracted to another realm of training and development. Now, here's the kicker. Edgar says sleep is the shadow of death, and this is occurring most every night. If you didn't eat a pizza at midnight, this is occurring. If you ate a pizza at midnight, you're going nowhere. You know, you're sitting there totally trapped by the body. But let's assume you didn't. Edgar says that you actually, in fact, he gave a reading. A lady came to get a dream uh, reading from him. And he says, oh, here's the soul who was at Arcturus last night. <laughs> she went, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, you were at the Stargate. And that left you with such a charge this morning. You were so vital and excited. And the dream was of that. In fact, he told her you should call this a vision, not a dream. So, you see, watch your sleep tonight. Great thing about a retreat like this is you sleep here a couple of times, you might have an experience. Uh, Casey's celestial activity is really the playground of us. You are only sojourning in material life for 80 to 100 years or so. But your soul's doing a lot more on the other side. And roughly 30% of your life is asleep. And your soul is on the other side in these celestial dimensions. This is why they were so important to Casey. He kept trying to emphasize to us, if you only knew you were a celestial being temporarily incarnating physically, you would have so much more fun with life. You really would. And most of us who have gone on this path, even though we've suffered a lot in the transition, have really felt the joy of the expanded consciousness and the higher vibes, haven't we? Yeah. Though it does have its suffering because it's hard for a predominantly focused terrestrial physical being to birth a celestial being. Jesus said it's just like a woman pregnant. You have to dilate your heart and mind. And that's painful. And then you have to deliver a part of yourself that is not so self. It's more a part of a whole. Well, we like self. I don't know if I want to let go of self. <laughs> you know, and the Buddha's teaching you all the same things. You know, desire possesses you here. So Edgar's got all of this. He compares our solar system to a university and that every planet in this solar system is a college within the university. And he comes right out and says astrology is correct in that the qualities of the planets are the training dynamics of that planet in the other dimensions. Now, guess who also was stunned by astrology and thought it had some deep meaning for humans? The depth psychologist Carl Jung. He knew, why are primitive humans studying the stars unless it has something deeply connected to them? They should be growing corn. And yet they're up there looking around. It's because it touches something deep within us. Here's Casey's quick list of what the different planets in our system, their higher dimensional qualities relate to us. And um, if you haven't figured it out already, this is the dimension of cause and effect of uh, karma. Uh, if you say, oh, I am such a celestial being. Oh, you think you are and a heavenly being and you love one another? We've got a place where you can prove it. <laughs> and that's what this dimension is all about. <laughs> um, so if you look at Job, it opens up with God turning to Satan of all people 
and saying, have you considered how good Job is? And Satan says, eh, you touch one thing of his physical body or his physical life and he'll curse you to your face. He's not inter interested in a spiritual mental relationship with you. He wants two cars in the garage, chicken in the pot, money in the bank, best looking spouse on the block. And God turns to Satan and says, test him. See if that's true. Now you see in ancient Hebrew legends, Satan was the tester. You were going to be tested. You know, like your professor in college, your teacher in high school, you were going to be given a test. And of course, Job passed the test. He doesn't curse God. All his friends tell him he ought to because God hates him. And he says, no, no, God is all merciful. If I did something wrong or my children did something wrong, I believe God is merciful. I'm, I'm not going there. So God finally comes to Job and says to Job, Job, I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to think before you answer it. Where were you when I laid the foundations of, of the earth? Um, if you read the history of the scriptures, they estimate that Job was 140 years old when he finished the test. And still, though, that's not old enough to be at the foundations of the earth, right? But if you read Genesis, um, uh, yeah, uh, just a little further down, you will see a verse in which God tells Job, you were created when I conceived the earth. You were with me, and you have forgotten this. Each one of us in this room, that's the truth. Now, we still have to pay the mortgage, yes. We still have to keep the body fed and cleansed and detoxed, yes. But truly, deep within you is an infinite, immortal, eternal being, companion to the creator of the entire universe. Here's the uh, book if you ever want to get into planetary influences and sojourn. It's all Casey reading, so don't think there's some... A uh, nice author in there. It's pretty tough reading because it's Casey readings. All right. Edgar says, you are a light, a ray that does not end, lives on and on until you are one with the source of light. <clears throat> and that light is the light of your soul mind. And it's right here with you. I will prove it to you right now. We wake up in the morning with a dream. And yet as we get close, we notice the bladder's full. So we say, I'm going to go empty the bladder, come back to the bed, and study the dream. You go empty the bladder, you come back to the bed, and what? How's that possible? That's not possible. I just had the dream. No, no. There are two parts to you, and uh, there's a veil between them. And they are you, and you are so comfortable with them. When you're in the dreaming you, your soul self, you are naturally comfortable there. Edgar was asked one time, what will it feel like when we get our full illumination back? And the smart Alec calmly said, familiar. <laughs> it is you before you were born. It'll be you after you die. Then you go through the veil and it's subtle. You don't feel it, but you are engaging the somatic nervous system to move the body uh, to the bathroom, you're in the outer self that didn't dream the dream. But it's still you, and you very much feel like you, but you have none of the content. Do you see? If you can learn to feel the subtleness of that veil and to make it more transparent, you actually will merge these two, and you'll become much more illuminated, much more enlightened. This is really key to your... Uh, Soul growth. Um, when Genesis said, let there be light, Edgar Cayce said that light was consciousness. So think of the light as the light of awareness of consciousness. And here's the quote from Job. The morning stars sang together and all the children of God shouted for joy at the coming of humanity. At the time, we thought it was a really cool place. I don't know how you feel about it now. Many of us want to expand out of here. Or change this place. Edgar says a big change is coming. It will be a glorious time. He actually gave two readings in, in which he said, Put it in your heart to be here then. 
You've been here during the hard times. Don't miss the good times. The golden age when no evil on the earth. All the souls are harmonious. Expanding consciousness. Higher vibrations. And it's coming. People read the revelation and all they see are the poisons and the battles and the Armageddon. We're already in the midst of the Armageddon. We've been in the Armageddon for a long period of time. It's about to change. And the light forces are going to win. Egger says, and you women should be proud of this. You know there's no way to get into this world except through a woman. You have figured that out. Right? <laughs> Okay, good. So woman is queen of this dimension. He says the vibrations of the wombs are going to get so high that only souls of those vibrations will be able to come into them. Whoa. Interesting time. Okay, he says spirit is the natural, the normal condition of an entity. And I picked this slide to kind of show that. And, of course, I'm walking around in a big lump of flesh and bone up here and trying to feel spirit. Here's a technique that will help you, and it helped me a great deal. How many of us have had pets that we knew very well alive, and they died on us, and we saw their bodies dead? How many? Show of hands. Good. How many of you might have seen a human that you knew well alive and then saw their body dead? So, Okay. What was missing? That lovely little cat or dog. What, what was in them? And then suddenly you see the dead body. What left? That's the spirit. That's the essence, the spark of their essence of, of expression of life and joy. Of uh, fear and curiosity. That was in there. And the human that you saw, that you loved that left the carcass behind and you looked at it and said, what left? What left? And then how many of you had that person die on you and sometime later in a dream, say, or even in an apparition, they came to you? Yeah. That's the essence. So if you can start feeling yourself that way, and when you look at another person and you're talking to them, Try to feel that in them and stop looking at their body so much. Their body does express their vibes. Yes, I'm not saying it doesn't. But if you could catch the essence in the eyes, the vibration. Do you remember the 60s? Some of you are old enough to be like me. We were into good vibrations. And we would say things like, oh, stay away from her. She's got bad vibes. You know, or the women would say that about us in college, you know, watch his vibes, man. Or they would say it to your face. <laughs> I don't like your vibes. And I go, oh, <laughs> vibrations, essence. Try to get in touch with that and feel that. And then you really become soul connected, soul friends. Now, uh, here is Lemuria, and it was not the lemur. The word actually comes from... <laughs> Yeah, Every, everybody will tell you, oh, that was the lemur in Madagascar. No, the word comes from the Latin word for ghost. In Lemuria, you were like spirits, ghost. Yes, later in Lemuria, you did become more physical. First like thought forms and then even like matter. Very much. The hope you have the same story. Now, here's a fun reading I wanted to share with you. Do you know we had non-physical spirit colonies on the moon? And Casey gives a reading for a young girl, uh, when she was a young girl. Uh, and here is the reading. Uh, as it has often been often presented by one school of thought, the dwellers upon the moon, that's his parenthetical statement, the satellite of the earth, preceded, preceded the abilities for matter. So this was before you were actually in incarnate bodies on the earth, expressed in a form that is known as matter in the earth, but it was this more subtle matter. You were living colonies on the moon. He actually says there are records still on the moon in the caves, and you'll find them. Um, 
Her mother, oh, wait a minute, and this entity was among those that so dwelt and is influenced by two sojourns on the moon. Her mother told her that uh, told us actually that when she was three or four years old, she used to gather the neighborhood children and tell them fairy stories about the moon and what she did when she used to live on the moon. One day, her father, it always has to be the father, damn it, gave her a spanking for telling lies. So she never talked about the moon again, and the mother regretted not having the, gotten the Casey reading earlier. So she would not have punished the girl because Casey would have told. Uh, the mother explains that she was nearly two years old before she learned to sleep at night. She would sleep during the day and stay up at night when the moon was out. Do you see? Can you feel that about yourself too? You know? Sometimes now that I've been on this journey for so long, I can actually feel a, a, a Jupiterian being, a, a soul who's very Jupiterian or very um, Venusian or very uh, mercurial or m mercury like. You know, uh, I can get a feel for where their most recent training occurred. Ke uh, Edgar used to call it sojourn, uh, planet of the previous sojourn. <clears throat> Let's see, i got to move a little faster here. So, yes, when we pushed ourselves into matter too soon, a certain group, there, the legends, the mythology of blending with animals was true. They pushed in and they were half that. Then in Atlantis, they developed this uh, wonderful crystal that could cleanse you and rejuvenate you. And Edgar gives readings for people who went to the crystal and it would like consume their body and purify it and they would live. He told one of them she went to the crystal so often she lived 6,000 years in physical body. And she was a powerful teacher and physician. Then, I love this part, then he says to her, the dimension became so mundane to this entity that she withdrew to the deeper meditations in Jupiter. Now, that's the way I want to die. When she said, where's John? And, oh, he withdrew. He withdrew. <laughs> I withdrew to the deeper meditations somewhere else. Now I'm going to share with you my Egyptian cleansing because I experienced this fire that Edgar talked about with the crystal. I have been uh, leading tours to Egypt more than 35 times. And, yeah, and I've meditated in the Great Pyramid hundreds of times and all of this sort of stuff. Anyway, one time early on, I was in the most sacred temple in ancient Egypt, which is like the uh, Jerusalem or the Mecca of the ancient Egyptians, Abydos. And um, we had seven chapels, and the Egyptian guide turned to me and said, what chapel do your, does your group want to meditate in? I said, the seventh chapel. There is no doubt about it. He said, oh, seventh? Okay. He didn't know why. We go into the seventh chapel. We all get into meditation. Now, it was tricky because there's echoing in this, and the, uh, there were no other tourists there. Our bus was there, but no other tourists. But the um, Egyptian guards kept telling jokes in Arabic and laughing. So I had to really strain to get deep. And I was straining and I was straining. And suddenly I was in the depth of a water pool naked and I was being cleansed. And as I came up the steps out, they anointed my head with oil and wrapped a cape around me. And I saw that there was a gauntlet of godlings and Egyptians, priestesses and priests. And they handed me the crook and flail. And, and I knew if I leaned it forward, I moved through them. And so I leaned it forward. I moved through. And they were all smiling and nodding at me. So I was smiling and nodding. Then I noticed at the end of the gauntlet was the sun, the real sun, a fiery ball of heat and combustion and it was gonna burn me up so i started looking at them real like <laughs> and they were going <laughs> and yet i knew if i crossed these i would stop and nobody would judge me i didn't have to go but for some crazy reason i was so into it i kept going and when i hit that sun it started burning up 
all my weaknesses, all my sins, all my judgmental memories. And then I loved it. I wanted to suck that sun in, consume everything, you know. And then something shook my arm. <clears throat> and I looked up and uh, it was the Egyptian guy that said, John, John, we got to go. The uh, boat's going to leave. I said, who are you? He went, oh, my God. Everybody grab him. Hide him from the guards. We're going to sneak out the temple. So here I am. You know, burning up all my sins. I just love it. Get on the bus all the way back. <laughs> Eventually, he says to me, what the heck was happening? I said, the greatest experience I could have asked for. That was terrific. So I personally had experienced what Edgar was talking about when he said, um, through the same form of fire, the bodies of individuals were regenerated by the burning through the application of the rays from the stone. Hence, the body rejuvenated itself often and remained in that land until the eventual destruction of Atlantis. So I actually experienced this, and it was just life-changing. And actually, for a few years after, and still now, to some degree, I can do it, but I've had other experiences that take me a different way. But for a few years after, all I had to do was close my eyes and go back into that, and uh, I just... You know, and people would say things to me like, wow, you're a different person. I, yeah, yep. Yeah. Not carrying any guilt, I can tell you that. <laughs> Which really weighs you down. Atlantean mistakes. I want to skip over this a little bit. The, the trouble here basically was the Atlanteans lost their attunement and they misdialed the crystal and it was tuned too high and destroyed the areas and that was very upsetting. Here are the two areas, Atlantis and Lemuria. Uh, those islands out there are the mountaintops of what used to be Atlantis and uh, Edgar Casey says the migrations were to all those lands you see there, they migrated. Uh, here's the prophecy. In the Piscean Age, in the center of Sam, we had the entrance of Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew word that means God among men. See, what did that mean? The same will be meant by the full consciousness, full consciousness of the ability to communicate with or to be aware of the relationships to the creative forces and the uses of same in material environs. This awareness during the era or age, in the age of Atlantis and Lemuria or Mu, brought what? Eventual destruction of man and his beginning of the needs of the journey up through selfishness. We had to learn to overcome self-gratification, self-exaltation, self-glorification, selfishness, and start to reach out and understand that no man or woman is an island. You affect everyone. You, you are a part of the collective consciousness. Your thoughts, your emotions, your attitudes affect the collective. And as soon as we start becoming aware of this and living in that sort of disposition of oneness with the whole, knowing ourselves to be ourselves, but one with the whole, the great uh, growth occurs. Uh, the purpose of the heart is to know yourself, to be yourself, and yet one with God. The purpose is that you might know yourself to be yourself, and yet one with the creative forces or God. Uh, individuation process is what Carl Jung taught, that you and I are actually learning to understand who we are. I'm going to skip through some of these because I'm running out of time and I need to go a little faster. So here's a wonderful diagram of a wood carving of uh, how your celestial self, your soul self looks and how your physical body looks and that the portal in and out is your crown chakra, your fontanelle when you were a baby, the soft spot in your baby body. That's how you came and now you can come in and out through that. Now, I have a few slides, so I'll quickly go through to show you that there are ancient things, like uh, Zachariah Sitchin wrote about, of flying devices and all that we were flying long before Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. As you descend out of heaven, Edgar said, there was an involution into matter with higher wisdom, and you could actually... Uh, 
fly. And as you can see in these uh, stone carvings on the wall in India, Ezekiel's uh, wheels, see Ezekiel's wheel, he said the spirit inside the wheel would move it. When Edgar was asked what was that wheel, he said it was an Atlantean flying machine. <laughs> Here's a Bimana uh, with Sanskrit words describing how it works, and there are records in ancient India of these devices. This particular Vimana was said to have flown by heating mercury. Now, we know in, in a mercury thermometer, it rises at, as it heats, but no one, I talked with several scientists, have figured out how this flying device could use heated mercury to really fly through the atmosphere. But here's the records from the ancient times. There's some belief that these things uh, are actually uh, there, carved in stone as uh, reminders. And the reason for that is we knew we were descending into less and less awareness. So we recorded a lot of it. And Edgar said, those are the Atlantean records that will be rediscovered on the ascent back out. And these will help speed up our ascent. Here, I'm in the very temple that I had the uh, cleansing experience in. And do you see the beam there? I've blown it up in gold. You see flying devices carved on that ancient Egyptian temple beam. Do you see them? You see something like a helicopter, something like an airplane, something like a submarine? Uh, carved right there on that beam. Now, uh, in the last minutes here, I want to take you, but this is there's so much material here, I'm going to have to skip through it a little bit. Edgar Casey actually teaches uh, in a series of readings how other dimensions, what they're like. And he, he does start out by saying it will be very hard for your three-dimensional mind to understand this. Um, but I will give you phrases. And uh, so I'm going to try to go through quickly so we still have some time. Uh, so this is the layout. And let me explain the layout. On the right side in the purple or violet is your soul celestial activities. On the left side is your incarnate personality living a life in the earth. And he shows this one particular soul is 294. And he shows that that soul came. Now go to the bottom of the diagram. That soul came out of the sun, the source of all life, incarnated in ancient Egypt and became the high priest Rata. When it died, it left to the stargate Arcturus and there gained universal consciousness because the stargate was connected to the vast infinity. Then it came back in, in Persia, as Yult, and manifested physically as Yult. And it was doing high idealism work until it was assassinated by the Greeks. Well, that pissed the soul off. So what happens? He goes out on a quick return. His body is murdered. So his soul has to leave. The body is dead. It won't function. But he is upset. And he looks for revenge. So if you want to get revenge on the Greeks, where's your next incarnation? Troy. <laughs> yes. He incarnates in Troy with revenge on his mind. And they capture the beautiful Helen uh, of Greece. I know we call her Helen of Troy, but let's not forget the story. You kidnapped her from Greece and brought her back. Anyway, they break in to, through the 12th gate, and he happens to be one of the guards of the 12th gate, so he kills himself because Troy is destroyed by the Greeks by a trick. A trick. So he commits suicide. <laughs> and now he goes to Jupiter because he's, Arcturus has left his soul feeling universal consciousness, and, and yet he has this bitterness over a certain group that he felt has tricked him and also assassinated him. And so he's mad at humans that are mean and don't appreciate his love and universality. Well, Jupiter helps him understand the broader universal collective, and he, he becomes aware 
of dark and light forces and how he must become sharper like Jesus, you know, until you get to a point, And when I got to that point, I realized my narrow vision and what you realize the God you're communicating with or consider it the creative forces, the universal consciousness, the infinite loves all of them too. Wants all of them also. Then suddenly you realize, and Edgar Casey gave a reading for a guy who was learning how to really fire up his chakras using breathing techniques, and he was having altered experiences, altered states of consciousness. And one time he was asking for more information, and Edgar interrupted him during a reading and says, You think it's far greater to be one of the children of God? It is far greater to be one with them. You're building a heaven all by yourself, and you are not going to want to be there when you get there. As disgusting as they are, you must go out and engage them as best as possible to help them and yourself. Because all of you are going to be there in the end. Now I understood what Jesus meant. The second's like the first, you know. But for a long time, I couldn't see that at all. So, any questions? Any? I've left a little time for us to kind of process a little bit. If you have questions... Uh, Hi, John. Hi. So, um, there has been a lot of information through David Wilcock. Oh, yeah, David. Can you tell me if it is true that David Wilcock says that he is an in reincarnation of uh, Edgar Casey? I will, I will. Uh, uh, David lived in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, where the ARE headquarters is, and I was CEO back then. I was the executive director. Now I'm the uh, director of the Edgar Casey Foundation. He came to me and he shared with me his feelings that he was the reincarnation of Edgar Casey. Uh, he hoped that I would share this information with um, others and uh, appoint him a position and let him start giving readings and all. And I said, David, I can't do that right yet. I'll tell you what. I want to set up meetings with Edgar Casey's son and his grandson, who are key members of our staff and board of trustees, and let them interview you and see how they feel. He said, oh, that sounds great. That's cool. I said, okay, good. So I set up the interviews. He met with them. Then I went and met with Edgar's son and grandson, and they both told me, they talked with him for two hours, and it's not their father reincarnate. So I called David back. I said, David, what can I do? I have got the son and grandson of Edgar Casey, members of the board of trustees, telling me you are not return reincarnation of Edgar Casey. I can't do anything. I said, but I promise you this. The ARE will never say anything bad about you. You go do whatever your soul moves you to do, and you can rely on us not coming down on you, unless you do something really bad. And he, and he went to the West Coast and became famous. <laughs> and uh, I used to get letters all the time and emails, uh, and honestly, it was 50-50. I would get 50% the greatest reading I ever had, and 50% I don't know who he was talking about. the reincarnation of Edgar Casey. 2,158. I said 158, not 58, okay? Two thousand In Nebraska. Yes. Oh, a Nebraskan. Hey! <laughs> but here's the real kicker. He and his feminine are united in one body. They are really together. In other words... Uh, we know who his uh, twin soul was. Twin means the yin of his yang. It was his stenographer. It was the woman that was taking all the inner information, categorizing it, indexing it for all of us to study. They were feminine and masculine of the higher soul, of the oversoul. You understand? Well, they're going to incarnate as one in the body in 2,158. By the way, he says, we won't be using the airfoil wings we do on planes. We'll be flying in cylindrical devices. The style will be shaved heads. I'm going to have to get used to that. Uh, he goes on and on about what it'll be like then. Yes. Okay. Anything else? 
Who is God? Uh, from the Edgar uh, Casey readings. Uh, now, you know, he was very much a, a, a mystic Christian. But when you pushed him on these type of things, he would come out of that thought pattern. And he would lift up and say, it is the universal consciousness. It is the creative forces that are not destructive, but creative, expressive in life, uplifting, uh, illumination, not uh, the dark forces of destruction, uh, condemning, judging, uh, hatred, all that. That infinite universal consciousness conceived all these points of consciousness that are us. So it's not a being. The being, Casey explained, is uh, what John wrote in his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's trying to show how there's no separation. So uh, Edgar says, the infinite never is a being, but it conceived of what beingness would be like, and that's the Word. If you read it in Greek, that's the logos. The, the English word, word, in that gospel is actually the greek word logos and that's a lot more than the english word word so you get the idea that uh the uh, god is an infinite consciousness and it conceived of the quality of beingness with a free will and let us all have that to become companions to the infinite Absolutely amazing. A round of applause for John Van Auken, director of the Edgar Casey Foundation, one of the most prolific writers and teachers on the planet today. Let's have a standing ovation to show our appreciation to John Van Auken.